uh, Petra, uh, for those of you who haven't read it, uh, what's the biggest tummy ache? Um, actually, it's quite easy. Uh, as you said, the title is The Unfree Trade, and the argument is that um, there are a lot of trade agreements out there that are labeled free trade, but we actually have to look what's in there. We have to look at the, fi at the fine print, and this is probably where we would all agree. There are lots of issues where we probably disagree, but um, the matter of the fact is that what fr is named free trade quite often is something different. It's something like property rights. It had lots to do with special interest groups getting special parts into those, into those treaties. And what happened in Germany, and I have to admit, I, I'm, I was really surprised to see 150,000 people on the streets for some arcane thing like a free trade agreement. I mean, aren't there other issues out there? I'm a Wong, I'm an economist, I, I like those issues, but that people would actually travel to Berlin hours and hours to, to protest against this issue is, is quite amazing. And I think one of the reasons why people are doing this is that they feel that something is happening to the trade crowd that has maybe happen to the financial people before the financial crisis. We leave too much to them. We just heard those trade wongs are still 19th century. And actually, this is what I, I've worked in Washington, I've worked in Brussels, and Pascal Ami is really an exception, but lots of these people are quite um, special. They deal with each other, <laughs> they are among themselves, and the problem is that Free trade deals or trade deals these days don't work like trade deals in former times, where one had a duty of 20%, the other had a duty of 5%, and then they were dealing a little bit behind closed doors, and nobody cared, and why should we care? These days, it's about um, obstacles to trade, about non-tariff barriers. And this term is quite important to understand why people, write, why people protest against trade agreements. What we name non-tariff trade barriers is everything. It can be social standards, it can be ecological standards, it's a lot of things that people care about. And the soon trade deals with those issues, people want to be asked. And this is where TTIP comes into the picture. TTIP, whether it's a new trade agreement or an old trade agreement, is a trade agreement that deals with those issues that people care about. How do we protect our environment? What kind of food do we want? all kinds of cultural issues. And the problem is they've never been asked. They've never been asked by the commission whether they wanted to give the mandate that then enabled the commission to deal with Americans. Um, in the process, for quite a long time, there was no transparency. And they have the feeling that those people over there, I think next week they will be in Miami, they deal about issues they care, and the, we, the people, don't have a say. And this is what makes people go out on the streets and, and demonstrate. And Quite a few commentators argue they don't understand the issue. This is a typical anti-globalization crowd. I think that's too easy as an explanation. Because in Germany, I saw, I was there, as, as you were just being told, it's not just trade unions and those crazy anti-globalization people. It was all kind of people. A lot of middle class students, old people, young people. It was a really mixed crowd. And I think if we actually want to get the trade regime right, we have to focus the issues those people raise, and we may discuss about it later on. It's, it's the democracy issue. I want to be heard. Trade agreements are not just about output. It's also about I want to be part, somehow, of the negotiation. It's the issue of democracy afterwards. When there's a regulation being made within this free trade agreement, is it the regulation that I want, and can I change it in just, I know, four minutes? As, as a last point, which is quite important, um, how can I still, within a trade agreement, change my society? And this is an issue with TTIP when it comes to changing regulation, not just to one of the fears of the people is that TTIP might lower, actually, for example, environmental standards. This is not the only question. The question is how can we hire them and how do we de do this mm -hmm. together with Americans? So lots of issues that have to do with regulation and nothing with duties and old-fashioned free trade. Thank you, uh, Petra, for, for putting uh, out that. And, and being a communicator yourself, I'd, I'd like to keep in mind uh, the point that uh, Bernard raised, uh, like, is it just a question of miscommunication, but uh, not to be answered right now. Andreas, um, uh, Bertelsmann uh, has uh, teamed up uh, with the IFO Institute and um, actually sort of uh, got together a study um, uh, which sort of describes the effect or the potential effect um, of... TTIP in this case, um, on countries 
that um, are not um, concerned, i.e. not part to the trade agreement. Um, I remember at the beginning of the year there was already some uh, study like that and basically it was saying like, yes, um, looking at 10 countries, you had three countries that had a slight better chance uh, in trade. We had three countries that had a round about the same kind of chance. We had four countries that had a slightly worse chance uh, to be proper partners in trade. So it seemed like sort of a zero-sum game. Um, has that changed in the new study? No, I think the idea of a zero-sum game if, if with regard to trade is, is somewhat wrong. I think what, is, what makes trade special is that this is something where cooperation uh, uh, comes up with benefits for everybody, or whether there is a chance. I think we can even agree on that. Uh, that there is a chance that cooperation and not competitive uh, com competition on these issues can, can lead to, to benefits to everybody. So it was not about equilibrating, looking, okay, here there's a, the, a win sum x no. and there's, there's the, the losing sum minus x. Um, that is not the case. Um, we are safer to calculate. Uh, as you can imagine, since these, these things are not even on the market, since transparency, as we all know, has, has its limits, and we don't know actually what's really in there. So we have to come up with, with assumptions and techniques developing. So we had, as you know, um, kind of uh, uh, different, different uh, um, uh, results, but they show all, all in, the, in the same direction, saying that in, in first order effect, so if you just look at these things, without spillovers, without adaption of others on, re on, on regulations and so on, um, you have a, a slightly positive effect uh, uh, within the TTIP countries, like in, like in Germany. Uh, you have a big number of countries where there is almost nothing uh, in terms of growth effects, and a few countries where you have negative ones. Nothing really dramatic, neither in the positive way nor in the second, nor, nor negative. If you apply spillovers, and I think there is some likelihood that this is really going to take place. So the fact that if you, you uh, have an agreement uh, on certain regulatory issues that the others will pick up on these and, and uh, kind of follow that part, if you bring that in, you kind of get an overall positive picture. And I think this is nothing which, 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 is, which can be, uh, is, is unbelievable. No, this is the, the, the natural thing uh, if, it's, if it's done properly. I think the, the resistance comes, as, as, it's, as it was mentioned, come, it doesn't come from the, from the economic side. It's, it's other things, more or less. It's a question whether this system is going to be, uh, has it enough adaptiveness in, in, in future because you, you fix things now and you don't know what is, what is, what's tomorrow and whether then you can, can adapt to these things and so on. But I think, and this is something which worries me, uh, if I look at, at Berlin, if I look at, at, uh, at the, the forums of Spiegel Online or, or, or the newspaper forums where, the, where it's not just, uh, there's just, just the left side, it's more the right, right wing side, which is, which is uh, uh, well, I wouldn't call it arguing, which is bashing uh, there. Um, the idea of cooperation is something which is, is under un, 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 un threat. I think that is a general thing, that you, you, if you do come up with some positive news on European internal market, you will be bashed these days. Um, and if you look at the history of trade uh, agreements, um, we might differ in the, in the perspective of NAFTA, um, but if you would ask the Mexicans what, whether, whether they, in, after all, would say, would they do it again, I guess they would say yes. I guess they would say, well, there, there is a, a tremendous uh, economic growth, there is uh, a, a, a GDP growth, there is income growth, uh, they have influx of people and so on. So there's a number, there's a number of, 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 of good argument that a trade agreement in general is something good. Um, and I think all we ask for, and there, there we, we can build a coalition, is that it's done properly. Um, um, but we, we, all our results show in that direction if it's done properly, it can be beneficial. Can I just um, ask you, Pascal, is the emergence of more and more regional trade agreements a reaction to the fact that the sort of central system that was once upon a time set up and seemed to be a good idea, um, W2O, has not produced the results expected? It's almost a philosophical <laughs> question. No, I mean, to some extent, yes. Uh, but 
a tiny little sum extent. Mm. Uh, the reality is that you know, if you want to open trade, uh, don't mind the color of the cat, prov provided catches mice. Whether you do this multilaterally, regionally, bilaterally, it's all fine. And by the way, it has always worked fine. Uh, there is a, I'm sorry for Bernard, I hope he's not going to bash me. If you compare the tons of academic literature on trade diversion and the reality in life, it's one, to one, one gram to one ton. It's good for academics because they can write lots and lots of things and make equations and so on, but in reality, there has never been a contradiction. Now, the important thing, and I build on what everybody has said uh, with which uh, I agree, uh, including for Petra in her soft criticism of TTIP, soft today, not like in your book, but maybe there's a reason to be softer, maybe there's a reason to be softer today. What I think we all have to understand is that in the world of precaution, there is no variable geometry. In the world of precaution, there's nothing like a preference. I'm not going to give a preference to Wand and Roses in relaxing my pesticide residue as compared to Costa Rican Roses or as compared to Israeli Roses. I mean, in the, in the old world of trade, I would give a preference to Wanda with a zero tariff and I would put 10% for Costa Rica and 20% for Israel because Rwanda is less developed than Costa Rica, which is less developed than Israel. In the world of precaution, this is out. So precaution is MFN. There's no way you can discriminate precaution because by definition, you don't discriminate your foreign producers and your domestic producers. And this is a huge change which raises problems for the WTO. Because the WTO, for instance, I mean, one of the big ideological pillars of WTO is special and deficient treatment for developing countries. But this is not available in the world of precaution. So how will WTO monitor this precautionary convergence in the future is, I think, an important question. I personally believe it should be given a mandate not to operate the convergence, because as Bernard said, trade negotiators know nothing about pesticide residues or cra car crash tests. Not, they're not totally incompetent. This has to be done by regulators, which are different people, but WTO should monitor this, not least to ensure the necessary transparency for the rest of the world. If US and EU agree on a common car crash test, which will lead to Europeans having uh, middle-sized bumpers instead of small bumpers, and Americans having middle-sized bumpers instead of big bumpers, which would be a big gain for the consumer. Now, if EU and US agree on a car crash test, this will be the world standard for car crash tests. Whether China, Korea, Japan like it or not, it will be. And if I'm a Rwandan producer of roses, I'll be happy to have one standard for Euro US and not two. That's going to be good for my, I, I can leverage my comparative advantage in roses much better if US and EU. So this is, this is not bad news. It's, it's a, just a different world where as was said by Petra and, and Bert and by you. It's, it's not a world of trade negotiations, of trade-off. I give you something, you give me something. It's a, it's a way, how do we organize regulatory convergence, knowing that a part of this regulatory convergence will take us into the field of values, which is, by the way, one of the reasons why this debate connects mm -hmm. with the GES uh, agenda on values. Because if it's about the size of car bumpers, there's not much values in there, frankly. If it's about GMOs, <whistles> different. If it's about animal welfare standards, whoop, whoop, different. It's about data protection. You've seen what happened last week. 
when the European Court of Justice killed the EU-US uh, agreement on, which is a trade agreement, on protection of data privacy. Mm -hmm. So this is much more complex. And one of the reasons why there are so many Germans in the streets is that Germany is a free trade country, but Germany is the peak of the precaution conscience in the European Union for a number of reasons, mm -hmm. which we all know. A lot of that having to do with the Nordic mythology, by the way. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting story. But this, this is the reason why they have a problem. And this is where Europe and US got it totally wrong in the narrative. This is what I mean. They, it's the reason why there were so many people in the streets is that Karel de Gort and Mike Froman, and Pascal. whatever somebody thinks about Karel de Gort and Mike Froman, got it totally wrong in the way they explained this to public opinion. They didn't explain what was the issue. Quickly, Petra, and then I want to continue with Joe. Yeah, very quickly. I, I'm fully with you, with your story. I like your story about that it's not about lowering barriers to trade, but it's about coming up with good regulation of all kinds of issues. But I don't really believe that your story is the European-American story. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I talk in Washington to people, they don't tell me okay. the story that we regulate together. Petra, it would be a great story, but it's not the Petra, story the that's The European Commission happening. issued today at noon, a new blueprint for mm -hmm. its trade policy. And in this trade policy blueprint, there is a full sentence that says, now FTAs are about regulatory convergence, and it can only work upwards. Maybe it's now, also the story of the Commission. Had we said that from the beginning, there wouldn't be 250,000 German people in the streets. If we had said, if they had said, not we, if they had said from the beginning, this can only work upwards. This whole narrative, which some anti-globalizers, let's be frank, these, yeah. clever, these people are very clever, have spread throughout German public opinion that this is going to lead to regulatory dumping and uh, chlorinated chicken and, uh, and uh, large bumpers and uh, bad lighters and terrible toys, which is what they've been spreading, it wouldn't have happened. Let's stick to the cats and the mice. Um, and, and therefore, I would like to come uh, back to Joe, um, uh, who actually was, was talking more about spaghetti. Um, one, one quick question. Um, you're not just sort of talking to Europeans or not just observing what's happening between the US and, and Europe, but you're also observing what's happening with other trade agreements. Um, have you ever seen a crowd uh, in Bangkok? Have you ever seen a crowd in Kuala Lumpur or um, uh, Canada uh, sort of saying we don't want that trade agreement with uh, whoever their sort of uh, counterparts would be, yeah. or academic debates. Crowds and academic or protesting in academic debates. No, um, I mean at the end of the year, not in Bern. They're not in Bern. No, it's, it's too expensive to get there. <laughs> <laughs> but even I'm just going way back to so the end of the Uruguay round. Even we had farmers being trucked in from various countries protesting and. You know, getting their video shots and then going off to buy clocks and chocolate. But we had Japanese and Koreans and so on come in. It's not just you know, regional agreements. It's, okay. it's the protected interests. So it's the, in the Jurassic agreements, the people mm -hmm. that are being protected from lower prices. Um, yeah, they, they protest. Right, okay. Um, on the broader issues, yeah, we've had, I mean, let's take Seattle. There's another, we, we've seen, again, an, even in a multilateral context,